hello and thank you. Um, it's such a, a big crowd. I wasn't anticipating that, so I'll try and calm my nerves. Um, I do appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to you today, so I want to definitely thank uh, Lisa and Annalise and, and Knut and the SACPA uh, board for welcoming me here today. It's kind of interesting, too, because they gave me a topic and said I could pretty much talk about anything I wanted. Uh, I could say whatever I wanted, so that might end badly. <laughs> but since it's live, I will watch my language and make sure that it, I keep it clean. So. So my topic is on the PC government and the current state of the PC government. As you all know, they have a, a we they have a new premier, and what does that look like? Um, and at first, the initial direction was to talk about can the PCs reinvent themselves? But what I found is actually at this point, that question is premature. Right now, can they survive? That's the much bigger question. And moving into a by-election, you'll see why that's extremely important. So what I've called this is actually sunlight is the best disinfectant. And it's a famous quote from a US Supreme Court justice. And it's about openness and transparency and accountability. Um, I find that Prentice's uh, approach, his strategy at this point is extremely transparent, so this is appropriate. Um, but moving forward, is the PC government capable of being open and transparent? That's a bigger question, but I thought it was an appropriate title for today. Before we can move on, we have to do a, a brief history lesson. In order to understand the strategy of the PC party, I think this is important. So it's very complicated. Uh, you need to write notes because there's a lot of information and detail. <laughs> this is pretty much it. The, Alberta has been governed by four parties, in order, actually. The Liberals served for 16 years. They were replaced by the United Farmers, uh, who served for another 14 years. Then the Social Credit came in for 36 years. And since then, we now have the PCs, who are on their 43rd year. Pretty straightforward. But it speaks volumes to the way that this province has been governed and the way that we vote. We are serial monogamists. Absolutely. And once we're done with one party, we, we wash our hands. We don't look back. Um, in fact, the United Farmers, after their devastating loss in 1935, did not have another seat in government ever. It pretty much decimated the party. So that's a pretty powerful message that's been sent. So when you talk about the state of government in Alberta, the fact that we, A, are extremely loyal to our parties is one thing. And the fact is, once we've dismissed you, you are dismissed. So the fact that we've kept the PCs around for 43 years is very telling. And there's some real support in that. And I think Prentice and his current government are hoping that that strength will lead him to victory in the next election. Because so, so when you look at it, it's pretty straightforward, pretty basic, but it definitely plays into his strategy. The next major component would be voter turnout. Voter turnout is extremely important as well because who ultimately decides who government is? Those that vote. And when you look at it, so voter turnout in the last 12 general elections has ranged between 40% and 66%. In fact, Stelmac's government at 40.59% 40 voter turnout is the lowest in history. The lowest, yet Stelmac managed to get a majority government. Okay, so even though voter turnout was extremely low, the PCs came out and supported their leader. Yes, we will give you another chance. We will give you a majority government. The other parties at this point, in my opinion, decided just not to show up. That is another factor in, in Stelmac's strategy. Um, this is also before the Wild Rose. The Wild Rose then started to mobilize, and you will see in the 2012 election, the Wild Rose made some major inroads, but what's important here is that the actual um, final turnout gave the, gave the PCs a large majority. They had 61 seats to the Wild Rose's 17, despite what the polls said. If you remember what the polling was, it gave the Wild Rose at least a, min a, minor a minority government. Not, and maybe, maybe, a, my, um, I can't talk right now, a majority government. The polls were very, very solid, yet the final result was extremely, or was extremely different than what was polled. So here you go. Again, the way that Albert Albertans vote is very loyal. Okay, so Redford was given a strong mandate. 
despite the fact that popular, the popular vote was very different. At this point, though, if you look, 56.96% voter turnout, that's high. She was, she was absolutely affirmed and the PCs were affirmed. So the way that she had attacked her, her strategy for government shifted because at first she was worried, the wild rose are gonna give me a run for my money and can we survive it? When she did survive it, it was, oh, I'm relaxed, I'm relieved, now I can just do whatever I want, which is technically the PC way. <laughs> I'm just saying. I could say what I want, it's my opinion. Um, part of the history lesson too is seats in the legislature. So right now there are 87 total seats. 19 of those belong to Edmonton, 25 of those belong to Calgary. This plays into, the stra into Prentice's strategy. 50% of the seats belong to the two largest cities in this province. So when you talk about getting reelected, who do you have to appeal to? Is it Lethbridge? No. It is not, it is Calgary and Edmonton. So this is very important and you'll see his strategy definitely targets these two cities in a big way. This is the current view of our government. Blue is PC, green is wild rose. Enough said, yeah. Enough said. Again, plays into the strategy moving forward. When you want to get reelected, do you focus your attention on, on the seats that you absolutely won't win? No, you focus on where you will. Which, so this is, is actually pretty telling. And, and I think we all agree in this room that after the 2012 election, um, we definitely felt the distance and the disconnect from government because we were wild rose um, and there were some consequences to that. Prentice is being far more blatant about his disregard for Southern Alberta and that's part of his strategy too, which is unfortunate because I believe that speaks to how if, if the PCs do regain power, how we will be treated in the future and that is a real problem. PC leaders, see they, these are past PC leaders while in government. I didn't go all the way back. I have to be brief, I only have 25 minutes. So let's talk about leaders, leadership of the PC party. Peter Lougheed, Don Getty, Ralph Klein, Ed Stelmack, Allison Redford, of course Dave Hancock, and now Jim Prentice. The first three leaders were solid leaders. They served long terms and they actually, aside from Don Getty being pretty much disliked um, at the end, he served, he served for a significant period of time. Ed Stelmack comes in, you know, there was some controversy, but he definitely had um, uh, an interesting run. He, when he was actually elected as the leader, he split the vote, came up the middle, there was some issues with that. However, what's interesting is that 144,000 people actually voted for in that leadership race. 133,000 made it to the final ballot. That's commitment. If you are elected leader, you can solid, solidly say that yes, a, a large portion of the PC membership believes that I can be leader, despite the way that it happened. Alison Redford, 78,000 people came out for the leadership vote. 78,000. Jim Prentice, 23,000 people cast their vote. 23,000. So what does that say about the loyal PC party, or, or the, the loyal PC members. They didn't even care enough to come out and vote for the leader. 23,000 is dismal, it is sad. There should be no celebrating when you only have 23,000 individuals come out. Yes, he won a landslide. He had over almost 18,000 of those 23,000 votes, but you should be ashamed. You are not connecting with, with the electorate, you are not connecting with your party. So there are some, some issues the party is facing. And here's an interesting note. According to Elections Alberta, there are 2,387,485 eligible electors on the elector list. 0.0075% of those voted for Prentice to be leader of the party. Democracy, isn't it fabulous? So when you talk about is, is a leader important, it absolutely is. In this current system, I would argue that the leader 
is irrelevant. And the way that the PC party has been treating their leaders, you know, they're scapegoats. Let's throw them under a bus. What I'm here to remind you is that this is a party system. The leader represents the party. And moving forward, the party has to figure out what it is, what it wants to be, and how it's going to govern this province. Because whether or not they get re-elected, which is a big question mark. You think it's a foregone conclusion that the PCs are going to get decimated in the next election. I'm going to argue that I wouldn't be so confident because of the way people are voting, because of the apathy, because of, of the strategy that's, that Jim Prentice is taking. He might just make you forget. Or he's hoping you just don't care. But moving forward, a leader does have a role to play. But this leader does not have a strong mandate. And yet he's acting as though he does, which is why he has an unconventional cabinet and some of the other things we're going to talk about. So now that... The history lesson is over. It was pretty painless, right? We don't have to do a test. You, should, you don't look stressed out. We're going to talk about Prentice's strategy because rebuilding the party again is one thing. He's not there yet. He's not even elected yet. So he has to focus on his priorities, which is to get himself elected and key members of his team elected. Okay? How do you do that? You have to win a by-election. What if he doesn't win a by-election? I don't really want to talk about that right now because who knows. But right now, his strategy is the new factor. His unconventional cabinet, his low-hanging fruit, fix schools and fix health care, win the by-elections, ignore southern Alberta, and by the next general election, hopefully they will forget. <laughs> That's his strategy in a nutshell. Let's dissect these, shall we? The new factor. I, don't, I have not heard one speech from Jim Prentice that doesn't include we're under new management. The party's under new management. The party's moving in a new direction. Uh, the province is moving in a new direction. New, 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 new. What's new about it? What's new about it? All he's done is they blame the old leader. They've distanced the party from Redford. Smart, good strategy. There was a lot of scandal around her. Um, she made some very bad decisions. The sense of entitlement was thick. Absolutely, distance yourself from that person. However, it's not just her fault. She has a caucus behind her who supported her, just like Ed Stelmack before had a caucus behind him and supported him. Ralph Klein before that. It is a party. This is not one person. And I could get into the details of democracy and whether or not this government is democratic. Okay? I have issues with, with party politics, and this is exactly why. Because the party becomes less than democratic, and there's nothing you can do about it. So the leader becomes the most important figure. And this is why Prentice's strategy about saying, I'm the leader and I'm going to change it, is problematic. Because one person shouldn't be able to change the whole party. The party is supposed to stand for something. It's supposed to, to have beliefs and principles. And if one person can unilaterally throw out what existed six weeks ago, I have a concern with the state of democracy. But that's not up for debate today, so new management. <laughs> Blame old leader, distance party from Redford. Let's reverse the bad decisions very, very quickly. And he did. He absolutely did. These were knee-jerk reactions. Let's, we'll talk about it. Like, let's, we'll get into more detail there, but the, the, uh, selling the fleet, uh, reversing the license plate, this was super easy and super quick to show change, change, change. Not necessarily. Okay? It's not about ideology. This is interesting in a political party. It's not about ideology. I heard a speech by Jim Prentice at AUMA, which is the Alberta Union, um, Urban Municipalities Association in Edmonton. And a quote that I keep using is, he says, let's not focus on the white noise of ideology. 
Last I checked, ideology was pretty important. So now you are the leader of the PC party and we're not gonna focus on ideology. Let's just forget about it. We play nice in the sandbox. We'll get along with the Wild Rose. We'll get along with the NDP. We'll get along with the Liberals. It really doesn't matter what party you're, you're part of or which party governs this province. That's a strategy. I'm not buying that. The white noise of ideology. Convenient, in my opinion. So this is one thing that I think if the party's gonna rebuild themselves, unfortunately, Prentice, you're gonna have to talk about ideology, and you're gonna have to rebuild the trust, and you're gonna, and, and, if, this, and if this province decides that the PCs don't represent what they want, then they should vote differently in the next election. And don't forget to inspire. This is fun. He's all about inspiration. I personally am not overly inspired, but that's because I feel like he's not really saying anything important. I'm going to be candid. And smile, always smile, even when they're throwing tomatoes at you. <laughs> Meet cabinet. It's funny, I thought it was hilarious. This is on the website. This is the PC website. None of these individuals in this picture are elected. Or women. I was I, I swore I was not going to bring in in the gender issue, but now it's pretty obvious. None of these individuals are elected. What's new about this? It's the old boys club, and there's some real concerns around that um, because it has to be addressed. And the other parties are going to bring it up. And the other parties are running female candidates. And what does this say? Low-hanging fruit. These are easy. What can we do really quickly to impress everyone? Well, let's sell, let's sell the fleet of aircraft because there's a lot of controversy around that. Is that not a little bit like throwing the baby out with the bathwater? I don't know. Why not do something simple like change the policy around using the airplanes? There is a policy, apparently. Nobody used it. So you know what? This is a management issue. Go back and look at your policies. How are, how are you managing your elected officials? How are you managing your, your bloated bureaucracy? Sell the airplanes, great, but let's not address the true issue here. What's your policy? And, may, and enforce your policy. It's super simple. Yet, no, let's just go ahead and make a grand statement and sell the airplanes without even looking at the actual cost. I, I won't do deny that it was very controversial the way that Redford used the aircraft, but that was one person. How much do they spend on air travel in total? How many MLAs are they flying all over the province, the country, or the world? Is it more economical to keep the, the airplanes and just change the policy? They didn't ask this question. I would feel a lot more comfortable selling the fleet if I knew that there was a better option on the other side. Scrap the new license plates. Well, that's, I would have done that too. That's <laughs> Good job. I'm very pleased with that decision. Uh, keep the Michener Center open. Definitely. There's value there, and I think that that was a solid decision, and, and it definitely played into their strategy. Announce an accountability act. Now this is an old one. Everyone uses this one. Openness and transparency. Let's, let's have an accountability act. I don't know, why not just govern with integrity and honor from the get-go? Why do you need an act to, to, to govern your behavior? Everyone talks about an accountability act, and there should be guidelines. This should already in place. This should be inherent in how we govern and how we expect our, our elected officials to govern. But no, we're going to bring, he's going to bring in an accountability act. Well, that's a relief. Okay, we're going to get something a little bit more touchy. Part of Prentice's strategy and any leader strategy moving into a by-election or an election is fix schools and fix health care. They've all done it. They've all said it. It's the same old rhetoric. This is a quote I took because I felt that it absolutely encompassed what we should be saying. 
Jim Prentice's new Alberta government has just announced it's going to spend $2 billion more over the next five years on new schools. But higher taxes have been ruled out, a cap is going to be placed on overall infrastructure debt, and there isn't even a whisper about squeezing more golden eggs out of the royalty goose. Be clear, the foregoing is not meant to argue that the schools are not needed. I concur. As a consequence of our booming economy, Alberta's young population grew 3.3% last year on its way to a total of more than 4 million. A plentiful supply of spaces and good schools is an obvious essential in making the Alberta advantage more than an empty slogan. But where exactly is the money coming from? Because it does matter. The thing is, is that this has been an pro ongoing problem for years. This did not happen in the last six weeks. This did not happen overnight. This has been going on for years and years. We have been well aware of our booming population. Schools have been in trouble. At this point, how come suddenly there is money, there's $2 billion sitting there that didn't exist six weeks ago, that does now? And the fact is, is most of that was actually previously announced. Now, it's all very convoluted because Prentice's strategy is to take credit for this. But here's my criticism. It's fine to build schools. How are you going to operate them? Thank you. I got goosebumps as well. How are you going to staff them? Logistically, if you're going to, if you need 600, 6 to 700 new teachers in the next three to four years, how are you going to find them? How are you going to pay them? Is it even feasible? The ongoing operating costs of opening this many schools is astronomical. And is it important? Is it necessary? Absolutely. But take the time to strategize, to plan. We all view schools and putting children into good-sized classrooms with all the resources they need as an important priority. This is irresponsible. Announcing it so you can win a by-election without properly finding the money is fiscally irresponsible. So fixing schools makes for a, gr I mean, it's a good announcement. Hopefully people go, yay, 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 you're going to build new schools and not ask the other questions going into a by-election because I guarantee you that going into a by-election, if people are duped by this and he wins the next general election, this will change because it's not feasible. The reality of this, unfortunately, won't happen, and the strategy moving forward will have to change. But he's banking on being in power, and then there's nothing you can do about it, because this is not sustainable. So it's important, and I would prefer if, as a government, he said, we are going to address this, and we're going to do it in a responsible manner, I would be more likely to vote yes. Next. Fix health care. I did not know you could fix health care in six weeks. <laughs> it's brilliant that they can. I mean, another quote. It's all a package. This is, this is from, uh, from Stephen Mandel. It's all a package. Access is really about creating capacity in the system. And in the past, we haven't had capacity. If you're running a business that 115% uh, occupancy, someone's going to not be in the hotel room or not in the hospital. We have to develop a system that has capacity to deal with access to it on an ongoing basis. Fantastic! Mandel did not provide details of how the government will create more long-term care beds, but said Tuesday's announcement at the Royal Alexandra Ho Hospital will begin the process of improving access to health care at all levels. They have no idea how they're going to do it. But in, on Tuesday, he was going to outline how exactly they were going to move forward and fix health care. Health care is a multi, I think they spend 19 or $20 billion dollars in healthcare alone. Is it? It's, I think it's around that. I should have checked. Um, you cannot fix healthcare overnight. You cannot. This is a problem that's been, been evolving, morphing, changing over how many years. Our system is broken. We are very lucky to live in a province where we have access to health care, but we would all agree that there's waste. There are ways to improve it. There are efficiencies that can be had, technology that can be utilized to make it stronger, better. Throwing money at health care doesn't build capacity. 
I agree, capacity needs to be built. This is an excellent statement. You cannot do it in six weeks. You cannot devise a plan or a strategy in six weeks. And again, you should not do it to win a by-election because it's serious. This is not about power. Healthcare is not about power. It is about our, our well-being, our future. It needs to be taken seriously and it needs to be addressed appropriately. Why isn't it being addressed appropriately? Because the true answer, the true solution is not popular and will not win you an election. So yes, building capacity, great. How is Stephen Mandel going to do it? Does it matter? Other details of Prentice's strategy. Ignore Southern Alberta. And I'm quite blatant with this one because essentially his strategy is, is we need to win the next election. To do that, we need Calgary and Edmonton. In this province, um, you either need both Calgary and Edmonton or you need the rurals and one or the other in order to win a majority government. That is going to be his biggest strategy moving forward. All the by-elections are in Calgary and Edmonton. Stephen Mandel will, will definitely win Edmonton White Mud. Calgary is a little bit different. The likelihood of Edmonton ever being a wild rose um, area is, is slim to none. However, Calgary, there's some real possibilities there. So I think when we watch the by-elections, you will see a clear indication of what a general election would look like. Will there be major change? Will there be turnover? Will there be some upsets? I don't know. <laughs> so, so ignoring Southern Alberta is part of his strategy. He wasn't going to waste time. Removing Greg Wedick from cabinet definitely has consequences. Um, if I was Greg, I know what I would do in response, but I'm not Greg. Southern Alberta will see the impact of this moving forward. If the rest of the province doesn't change their vote, we will be left out. Um, Essentially, I believe that Jim Prentice is screaming for, please, 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 just give me a chance. Give me a chance and I will prove to you. I will make, I will make bold decisions, but right now, you just have to give me a chance. So moving forward, is this a good strategy? Will it work? Do you know what? Probably. Probably. We know in southern Alberta that this government is old. The PCs they haven't changed, they haven't evolved. Unfortunately, the voter is quite fickle. And his strategy has successfully distracted people up north. He is giving them promises that they want. And I believe that will translate into votes. He doesn't care if it's low voter turnout. He doesn't care um, if, if if they have a majority or a strong majority, he just wants to win, then he will prove it. Um, and I think that by bringing in too strong, in his opinion, too strong unelected individuals into cabinet speaks to that. It says, and yes, I'm wrapping up, thank you, because everyone's hungry. It speaks to part of what he wants to do once elected. Stephen Mandel, I think, might make some bold changes to health care. But again, those changes aren't popular and won't win elections, so they're not discussing that. But he's hoping, just give us a chance. We will prove to you. But how many chances have we given them? Amen. <laughs> he got the last word in. <laughs> With that, I will wrap up. Um, I hope it was informative and not too, too bold. Thank you so much. <laughs>